Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to episode 70 of the Crochet Circle podcast. How are you doing? I hope you're all well. I hope the Crochet Clan is doing, doing all right. Um, yeah, we have gorgeous sunny weather here today, which always helps. It's been a bit cruddy. Um, it's not it's not been great here over the last few days, so I'm pleased to actually see the sun out and uh, for it to not be raining because it's quite noisy in here when it rains and yesterday I was like, oh, I might have to delay recording for a day if we get the same weather, but it's gorgeous and sunny. Pom Pom has just gone stalking outside looking for birds. So please do it sunny because uh, the rain was just too much and e- <laughs> and it's been really windy on Sunday we had a window of opportunity to get up. We've got scaffolding on the front of the house because we've just had it re-rendered. And I had to get up onto the scaffolding, and our house is quite tall, and then onto ladders on the scaffolding and stand on the very top step of the flat bit of the ladders and seal in down the sides of the window frames (laughs) because the, the render contracts, so you need to seal it into the frame. And it was really windy. And I'm generally okay with heights, but, oh, I was there were a few bits where I was like, I don't like this, I'm not enjoying this. And Matthew was down on the ground. Um, It's a job that he is perfectly capable of doing, but I'm ridiculous when it comes to, like, detail and things being neat. And he's not neat enough. So I was the one up the scaffolding, up the ladder, doing all of that in the wind, but we had to wait for the weather to just give us like a little glimmer of opportunity. And then it was like, right, let's go. But there was still wind and it was like, I'm not, I'm not enjoying this. But the job is done, the house is looking good, scaffolding's hopefully coming down. And then we'll get our house back to normal, which will be really quite nice. So this month has been a bit full on really, because we've had loads of house stuff occurring. And, um, I have been going for it with my dad's knitted jumper, which is one of my finished objects for this month. Um, It was a little bit late, but I'll go into that (laughs) and uh, I'll explain when I get to finished objects bit to final destinations. So, what should we start with? How about old dog, new tricks? I've got a couple for you. I've got one which is really quick. And I got this, um, I've been doing some online training on designing crochet garments. And there was this really good little tip in there. And I was like, oh, I'm having that for old dog new tricks. I'll be, I'll be nicking that. Um, and what, what it is, is how often are you out working on a project and you've forgotten a ruler or a measuring tape? Like It happens to me all the time, even though there should just be one in my design kit. All too often, I come out of the house and I don't have a measuring tape with me. And one of the tips in the training was that the gentleman that was given the training knows a specific measurement on one of his digits. And I was like, oh, let's go and get the measuring tape. And so what I worked out is that on my left hand, if I take my index finger and I go to the base of the web, between my index finger and my middle finger. From that base up to the knuckle crease on the inside is three centimetres. And from the knuckle crease to the top of my finger, not including the fingernail, because obviously that changes in length, but knuckle crease to the top of my finger is five centimetres, which is basically two inches. So no matter what what system you use, metric or inches, you'll be able to do this. So I know that my finger from the base of the web to the tip on my index finger on my left hand is eight centimetres. And within that eight centimetres, I have got a measurement of three centimetres or five centimetres. Now, this wouldn't matter for an awful lot of like crochet patterns that you'd be making. But if you go into crochet garments, quite often the pattern would say continue in pattern until piece measures x centimetres or inches and that's the kind of thing that you need to just keep on measuring so you now have your own personal measuring tape and what I would say is if if you're right-handed try and find a measurement on your left hand and if you're left-handed try and find a measurement on your right hand 
What that means is, because I'm right-handed, I use my left, that means I've still got my right hand for writing down the measurements, and if I've got a much longer piece, then I can quickly hold, like, my other index finger on my right hand to show where I, where I got up to, and then move my left hand. So I'm using the dexterity of my right hand to keep my place or to do the writing. So... Great little tip because I can't, I mean I can't tell you how many times I've been caught out and haven't got a clue how long my my piece of work is. So I have three centimeters and five centimeters, eight centimeters on that one finger. I suppose I could have done my middle finger, but actually it's easier also to use your middle finger as a measuring device because <laughs> quite often you're going to be out in public doing this and maybe you don't want to be waving your middle finger around in public. It's much more polite to just use your index finger. I hadn't thought about that till now. Please use your index finger. It's the easiest one to use. <laughs> Do not waggle about your middle finger because people tend not to like it. So that was Old Dog New Tricks number one. That was the quickie one. The second, I'm not going to go into loads of detail because I've pulled together what I think is quite a comprehensive blog post. And it's all about how you choose yarn colours. Um, and I've kind of come at it from two angles. One, like the colour theory. What is supposed to go well as colours together? What is the perceived wisdom around choosing colours? And the other part is on a more practical point of view as people who use yarns. How do you practically pull colours together, how do you practically buy colours when, um, and this is feedback I got in particular, let's say you live in Australia and you might be hundreds if not thousands of miles away from your local yarn shop, so you can't just walk into a shop and assess colours and say, well, those two look fabulous together, I'll buy them and off I go. So, like I said, I've pulled together a blog post, but before I finished that off, what I actually did was took to Instagram and I asked you, the Crochet Clan, and I said, how do you choose colours? And all of the loads and loads of comments I got back from you, I have pulled together and I've added them into the blog post. Um, so there's loads of inspiration in there about where you can find colour inspiration, including hashtags and Pinterest and Instagram and like, nature. And I've shown you some of the photos that I collect in my phone when I see colour combinations that I may, may want to replicate in a design. Um, so there's all sorts of information in that uh, blog post. And like I say, I start with colour theory and take you through the colour wheel and primary, secondary, tertiary neutrals and talk about how then you can blend and change colours from there. There's so much practical advice. Um, even things like if you don't get to a local yarn shop, can you get shade cards, like build up yarn dyers or build up commercial yarns that you really love? Especially on the commercial side, they're more likely to have shade cards. And if you don't have a local yarn shop, it's really probably worth the investment in buying shade cards. Usually you have to buy them because they cost quite a lot of money to pull together. The other thing is to look at colours maybe on your tablet or on your phone because the screen resolution that you have on those are likely to be a high be much better quality than you would have on a computer screen. Um, but I've also provided a link on how you can choose, uh, sorry, how you can check um, the colour definition that's occurring through your computer screen. Did you know, for instance, that Lovecrafts allows you to save collections of yarns in... Um, in your profile so you could find a design that you like and then you could go to Lovecrafts and pull together lots of different collections of yarns and see if the colours work together like let's say for instance you're going to do a pattern let's um any any crochet colour work pattern you can call the collection that and then you can start pulling together colours keep them in that collection because they'll save it for you on their website and you can chop and change your colours and see what works for you so you're able to make a few more informed choices before you make that purchase. This blog post is full of so much information and ways of looking for colour inspiration and the technicalities behind it. Please go and give it a read. Like I say, thank you to the Crochet Clan folk that came back to me on Instagram 
it was so helpful to get your take on it because um, some of you just had a completely different approach to how you choose colours and you give me lots of extra like hints and tips for choosing your colours and, and how you go about that process. So it's not just a blog post from, from me, it's got a lot of your inspiration in there as well. And that's something that I would like to be doing more of. So um, I think for every blog post that I'm pulling together that I need feedback from before I finish writing up the piece, I will be taken to Instagram. I should also be putting in Mighty Networks. Apologies, I didn't do that this time. I will do that next time. Um, and I will be asking you what your ideas are behind it. So the next blog post, just to give you a heads up, is most likely going to be on adding a knitted rib. I know many of you don't knit, but I also know that a lot of you are primarily crocheters, but you can knit. And I know that not everybody loves crocheting rib. I do not enjoy crocheting rib. And wherever possible, unless I'm designing, I would look to knit that rib instead. And what I am trying to work out is, is there a ratio? Let's say you're using a five millimetre hook for the body of the thing that you've made and then you need to add rib and you want to knit it, what is the ratio? Do you use a 5 mil set of needles? Do you use 4.5? Do you use 4 mil? Does that change if you're doing 1 by 1 rib versus 2 by 2 or 3 by 1? That how What makes the difference to that piece? I'm sure, like most things, there will be a formula in there that works. So I would just want to try that formula. But has anybody else had experience of adding knitted rib into crocheted patterns? I would love to know if you have and what experience you've got. Like I say, I'll pop this onto Instagram and Mighty Networks as well. So more on that. Um, and again, just to say thank you so much. I had some new patrons um, sign up last month. I really appreciate um, you patrons supporting me. You know that I don't bring extra video content, but what I like to do is pull together this information um, because it's it's more useful than hearing me waffling on another time in the month, I think. And so it's really lovely that the, like, there was recognition of the amount of work that goes into this. So thank you for that. It's your patronage that allows me to use my time to pull together this really detailed information. So thank you. So, moving on to final destinations, I have a few bits. One of them is a whopper, because it's my dad's jumper, and uh, some of which I can't show you because they've already gone off to their recipients, but I have taken photos, so I will add them into the show notes and I will pop them up on the screen. Um, the first thing that I finished was my Scandi Buster, Stash Buster hat which is a pattern by Michelle at um, Dora Does. And I really enjoyed doing this. It was so quick to make, honestly. It just didn't take me very long. One, because I was using an Aran weight yarn. <laughs> and two, just because it, it's linen stitch and the pattern was really intuitive. So it was like a breeze to make. I made it much earlier in the month. Um, and it, yeah, it was so easy to make. So the yarn I was using, uh, it was from Outlaw Yarns, which I bought when I was out in New Zealand. And I used two colours. And the way that I followed it in the pattern was um, to do alternating rounds of the two different colours. And in linen stitch, that then gives you like um, stripes coming down vertically. It looked really cool. I was very pleased with the outcome. And the reason I don't have it is because... I showed it to my niece yesterday and she was like, mm, well, they are my colours, aren't they? <laughs> and, and that was that. Darcy took it home with her yesterday and uh, off, it, off it went. And she was like, driving off with it on her head with a little bobble going. So I know it's going to a good home that Darcy's very happy and won't wear it. And the colours I chose are in a dark um, tilly green blue very kind of like mallard duck colour and um, quite a dark warm mustard colour 
and those two together looked amazing. And again, I went out to Instagram and I asked you what colour um, pom pom I should add, and uh, it was almost like a fifty fifty split between the two. And then loads of people messaged me and said, "Why not just do them both?" So that's what I did. So she had a little um, teal and mustard coloured pom pom on the top, and. That has gone off. So like I say, I will add a photo of Darcy Do in that hat. Um, really loved the pattern. Like I say, it was very intuitive. And I'm thinking I will just make another one and use up the rest of these yarns. But maybe dominate um, the next one with the mustard. Because the one I made for Darcy, the brim, which I knitted, um, was in the teal and the very top was in the teal and then the mustard all alternated. So I'm fairly sure that if I looked at the weights I've got left, I've got enough to make another one, maybe without a pom-pom. And I might actually get to keep one of my own crocheted hats. But it's very warm because this yarn is a mixture of, it's 45% Polworth uh, wool, 45% alpaca and 10% possum and it is just as warm as a warm thing and if you imagine that in linen stitch and in an iron weight yarn and this is 200 meters per 100 grams it just was lovely and toasty so it's gone Doris has it uh, but I will make another with the remnants partly because like I enjoyed the pattern but also, I don't, I don't really want to put this back in stash. I don't know if anybody ever gets to that point where you've got bits left and you're like, I don't want you back in stash. I want every last drop of you to be used and made into something. I don't want to take you back upstairs to my, to my hive. I just want you to be done. <laughs> so I might, I might leave this downstairs until, and then it'll just keep on prodding me to make another hat. So one of the reasons that I only managed really to do one crochet project this uh, month is because I've been knitting on a whopper of a jumper for my dad. It's still slightly wet but I've pulled it off the block of mats so I could show it to you properly. Um, I, pre I pretty much worked on this all of last week. I was I was meeting him for dinner on Saturday night and I really wanted to get it finished and pass it to him. But I knew that I needed to wash and block it and so I I didn't manage to finish it anyway. He would have been taking it home with like one finished sleeve and one, <laughs> one qu quarter finished sleeve. Which is, I don't think, the look that my dad is going for. Um, and it's the reason it's taken me for so long is because my dad is like quite large. He's very tall, he's got a wide frame, as I do. And he is frankly built like a brick poo house. He's he's not a small man. And therefore, he requires a large jumper. <laughs> like, it can fully hide me. I tried it on before I blocked it and I was like, oh, <laughs> I was stuck inside a massive jumper. Um, but I'm pleased to finally have this done. He goes to Iceland on Sunday. This will be dried by tomorrow. I will get it in the post on the next day delivery on Wednesday. And it will be gone. And I know for sure he will have it for Iceland. He's already packed his bags because he's that excited. And um, in his bag is the other jumper that I made him, which is also an Icelandic yarn, uh, which I made for him for the last trip he was meant to go on. But because of the pandemic, he didn't get to it 18 months ago. So he now has two Icelandic jumpers to take to Iceland and wear while he's over there. So in case you're wondering what the yarn is for this, it's a really interesting yarn. I still haven't tried crocheting with this because I'm just not convinced that it's going to work unless you're working with a big hook and you are, you're making something that's quite an open gauge, but that might work against you. I held this um, double stranded and even with that it's still very friable, it literally will just pull apart but you do get a bit more strength with it when it's double stranded. It doesn't have a ply to it, it is basically carded wool which has then been combed out so that it makes a single strand but it has no twist on it at all. So it just like pulls away no, really easily. Um, but when you double strand it together, you get a little bit more strength 
and it's difficult to work with to begin with and then you just get into the rhythm of it you know as you do with most yarns you know how much you can tug on it you can feel when it's thinning out you can feel when your tension has changed and I have to tell you this is a great one for getting consistent tension with because you don't want your yarns to keep on breaking it's easy to start in a new side a new end when you do but it's a faff it's not something that you want to have to keep on dealing with but what this type of yarn does is it's got a lot of air in it and that air means that it traps in the warmth from your body and it also helps to keep moisture out so the reason that my dad wanted one of these is he he hates when he's over in Iceland or up a mountain or up a hill having to wear big bulky jackets <clears throat> and he doesn't want to keep on taking a jacket off when he gets into the car and putting it back on and the nature of wool is that it will keep you cool when you want to be cool and warm when you want to be warm so this allows him to hop in and out of the car in Iceland when he's going like tromping off for 10 minutes to go and see something and then come back he can just wear this on top of a base layer and be warm no matter what he what he is or what he's doing whether he's in the car or not so hopefully he likes it I don't have a photo of him in it yet because you know like I said quarter sleeve and we were in a really nice Chinese restaurant when I made him try it on and I didn't think it was the place to take photos of him in it where um so he has promised to send me a photo of him in it at a glacier in Iceland next week and of course I will share them here for you it will be hilarious because my dad thinks selfies are the most ridiculous things ever. Apparently, two people in a photograph, not a selfie, one person in a photograph, selfie. Um, so he thinks that's ridiculous, but it's okay for us to take a photo of us together. So I love the idea of my dad having to take a selfie of himself at a glacier, um, possibly in front of other people. I will laugh my ass off when these photos come through. So that has taken up most of my crafting months because it was a deadline. I really want my dad to have this for um, for going to Iceland, which he will. And, you know, this was his birthday present essentially from two years ago. So I have finally delivered on the birthday present front. I'm very pleased. The, um, the yarn colour is like a mid-bordering lapis blue. And every now and then it's got a little fleck of this bright, bright blue in it, which is lovely. And you get flecks of grey. And the other thing I should say about this yarn, whether you are crocheting with it or knitting with it, it's not a great thing to finish off with. So what I've done is cast off the edges of the collar, the arm sleeves and the um, waist rib with Einband, which is another Icelandic yarn. It, it's a lace weight but it's a much hardier yarn, so that cast off edge is really secure because I've used that slightly different um, wool on it. And I did that in a very dark grey colour just to give a bit of a contrast. So, and he really liked that. He was like, oh, I like this little detail. So that's nice. Like, I know my dad likes it. He just, when he tried it on, he was like, it's a bit, it's a bit tight across my chest. I'm like, don't worry. I will wash it and block it. It has been measured out. It has been made to your size. It has been custom fit, which it has. Um, but he was just a bit self-conscious about it being tight on his chest and on his, on his tummy. So hopefully I have done his birthday present justice. I'm so pleased to see this go. You know what it's like when you have a project that you're just like, you're taking so long, I cannot wait to get you out of my life like I enjoyed making it but it was a bit of a rush towards the end I finished it on Sunday and I'm like I cannot wait to post this off and say goodbye it's basically about 650 grams of wool that I have knitted up in DK so that is that is no small undertaking but you know it's for my daddy and I love him and I know he'll wear it so that's like that's all you can ask for really isn't it you can make something for somebody that you love and they're going to love receiving it and they're actually going to make use of it. So, very happy to make things for my dad. It. Right, what else do I have? Two other quick makes. 
one were my fussy fox socks for Jenny. Um, got them finished off. I will definitely pull that design together because when I gave them to Jenny, she loved them. And then she came back to me a few days later and said, they're my favourite socks. And I was like, right, but why are they your favourite socks? Is it because they're bright pink and like a turquoise colour, which are her favourite colours? Or is it because of the design? She was like, it's the design. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So that lets me know that it's a design that I want to put in place. And we went down to see them the other weekend. And when we did, I gave Jenny her socks. And then her eldest saw her socks. And he is a little, he's a, he's a sock fiend. He loves handmade socks. And um, he saw Jenny's and he was like, I like them. Do you think Faye could make my Christmas socks like that? Um, because I'd taken loads of yarn down with me and they all got to choose what colour of Christmas socks they want this year. And so the eldest was like, I would really, I would really like Fussy Fox socks. So I may, like, I may have made a rod for my own back there, but I, yeah, I think he's getting Fussy Fox socks in his preferred colourway for Christmas too. So... Right, my final little finished object is a couple of project bags. I, l I really love doing embroidery. I enjoy it. It's good fun. It, it's a quick and easy project. And while I was in the middle of uh, the jumper for my dad, I just really needed a quick project that I could see the end of. I needed the dopamine hit of finished objects. And embroidery does that. It's so quick to do. And you get a finished object in no time at all. And I really like doing embroidery onto project bags because um, it means it's something that's useful and usable. But then I've got a little embellishment on it. And for those of you that have bought Murit magazine, you will have seen that there is an embroidery motif as the non crochet project. It's by Chrissy Ashbridge of um, Chrissy Creates. And I did it using scrap yarn first time round. So the the stem of the dandelion and the flower head and the little leaves that are kind of hidden are all in little scrap nuggets that I had left over from a Rivernets project. And then the dandelion clock head, which is in the magazine, it's like a spent dandelion head that's on its way. So you know when it takes on that like silvery grey fluffy quality when all the leaves have died back and it's about to spread its horrendous seed everywhere in your garden that is what the design is and I had some a tiny little nugget left of blue sky alpacas from a positivity um, spiral cowl that I'd done and it was just absolutely perfect for my dandelion head and so that's what I used it for. So that one is on a grey cotton background project bag, like just a little drawstring bag, which is great for one and two skein projects. And then I was enjoying myself so much with that that I went searching and found a little drawstring linen bag that I had from the early days of opening the shop. And um, I thought, well, it would be quite nice to <laughs> embellish that too. And so instead of using yarn scraps on this one this time, I actually um, went and got the... I sell 100% um, wool moir thread in the shop. It's made in Spain. It's a single um, thread of yarn. It's not plied and it's 100% wool and it goes really nicely on linen. And I knew that I had um, the colour 801 of the mustard is exactly the colour of, of dandelion heads. So that was my starting point. And then I found a nice heathered brown for the um, for the head of the flower. And then quite a dark green for the leaves and for the stems. And then because I'm me, I can't just follow somebody's pattern. I also added two other dandelions. So the pattern is for the the main opened up completely opened up dandelion head with the leaves and the stem and then I I thought I'll just add a little extra dandelion that isn't just quite as big and open and then I thought well if I've done that I may as well add another little one with the closed up head you know how they look when they when they're ready to burst open before they bring their firework on 
So I added one of those two. So three little dandelions, well, one dandelion plant, three dandelion heads, all on one bleach, bone bleached um, lemon bag with a nice little, I changed the ribbon over so it was more fitting for the project bag. <coughs> so just a quick one on designs in progress. There's a, there's a lot going on. There's always a lot going on, but it feels like there's a lot, a lot going on at the moment. Um, but one of the things I did finally do was I got my Stormy Rainbow blanket out. It has been released. This blanket was so popular in Inside Crochet. It was in um, issue 127 and it people just loved the dark, earthy rainbow of this blanket. So I knew that when I got the rights back, I had to get it out as a pattern in its own right. And so I have just done that. But what I've also done is updated it with a another colour combination, which brings in a slightly different striping sequence for the blanket using Rivernet's Chimera yarn, um, <clears throat> which uses six colours rather than the 12 of the normal mm. blanket. What I would say is this is a really good pattern if you have got four ply mini skeins coming as an advent calendar because you could stripe it out with um, 24 mini skeins you need 10 grams of 24 mini skeins to be able to do that or if you had a 12 days of Christmas one which was 20 gram mini skeins then that's the way that the pattern set out if you've got an advent calendar coming in four ply this might be a good pattern for you. You also need 300 grams of uh, main colour. And I really honestly would look to go with grey for that because it just, everything blends with grey. I don't know of a colour that doesn't work with grey. Grey is amazing. Like whether you go for light or dark, I don't know a colour that can't work with grey. So it's a really good blender to put in with lots of different colours of your project. So much so that I'm working up another blanket uh, with grey, but that's that's a long, long, long-term project that will be ready in about a year's time. <laughs> this is how my life works. Like to all intents and purposes, it might look like every month just something happens, but some of the stuff that I'm working on is like eight months, two years in advance, and I can't. I just can't tell you about it all, unfortunately, much as I would love to. Um, yeah, that's that's the deal with submissions and commissions. You can't talk about them until they're published. Um, more stuff to come in Designs in Progress. Uh, there's just, I'm really loving designing at the moment. Having taken that step to not do yarn shows has massively freed up time and my creative brain has like whomped up a notch. I woke up on Saturday night, I don't know, maybe three in the morning and um, there was a blanket idea going through my head and I was like, just go back to sleep, you'll remember it. And then my brain was going, you never remember the designs when you go back to sleep. Get up and write it down. So I put it in notes on my phone and discovered that in my notes section, I also have a little thing so I can do handwritten notes and you can change colour. So I quickly mapped up how it was going to look on my phone. I was like, that's enough. Phone down, go back to sleep. And then I was like, but are the numbers divisible? Will it actually work? I was like, it's fine. I've written the pattern down. I can work that out later. My brain was like, no, you need to know it now. I was like, right, calculator out of my phone. And then found a formula that would work. Wrote that down as well. And I was like, now... Please, brain, just let me sleep. And that was enough that it cleared my brain and I was actually allowed to sleep. But that was like probably about half an hour diversion from sleep because my brain was just firing ideas and concepts at me for a new, a new design. I'd rather have that than ha never have another idea again in my life. I'd rather be woken up than not have that creative flow, for sure. Next up... Is on route my whip. I only started this last night. I hadn't intended on making a new garment, crocheting a new garment, but, um, and I'm sure, let me know if you are also in this position. Matthew put a wash on 
and didn't have his glasses on when he put the wash on. And even though I have put, <laughs> this is a great tip, it doesn't always work though, obviously, um, bright red nail varnish on all of the washes on our washing machine that we use, so like the wools, the cotton, the coloured um, loads, and done the same for the spin cycles and done the same for the um, temperature. So he should only ever really be pointing to any one of those. And he put it on, he put my woolly jumpers on a delicate wash, which does more spins and more it agitates more than the wool wash does. And he shrunk three of my jumpers. They were all shop bought, which is just as well. One of them was like one of my favourite little cropped mohair jumpers I wear all the time when I'm leading up an outfit. I was so frustrated with him. And um, yeah, so three of my jumpers ruined for me. Um, I had one big grey baggy jumper which I loved, which is now not baggy at all. I can still wear it, but it was like my... We, we call it a mufty day. <laughs> Do you know what I mean by that? When you're having a slouchy day and you're just, you're not quite in your pyjamas, but you're in like really comfortable, like lounging about wear, that's a mufty day. So that was my mufty day jumper. He ruined my mufty day jumper, which is just like so annoying. All because he wouldn't wear his glasses to look at the washing machine dials. <laughs> If you own one of those humans, like I own one of those humans, I sympathise with you because it's so frustrating. Um, so yesterday when Darcy was over, she took my mohair jumper because it now fits her. She's a, she, like I'm a size large, she's a size extra small and Matthew had shrunk it enough that it fits Darcy. So she was like, yeah, yeah, I'll have that please, thank you. So she walked out of here with a pair of hand-knitted socks, a bottle of perfume, a crocheted hat and a knitted jumper um, that Matthew shrunk. So she, she was doing really well yesterday. But I was like, right, I want a cropped jumper back in my life. I Actually, that jumper I have in three different colours. I've got it in black, had it in blue, and I've got it in a berry colour. And, um, but I, I, I want another one. I wear them all the time, I want another one. So I was like, right, make yourself one. Go and find one, make yourself one. And this pattern is called the Cloud Crop Top. It's by um, Colleen at Evolve Crochet. I saved this on Instagram the other week. And do you remember saving on Instagram is when you see something that you like, there's a little ribbon symbol, click on that and it saves it into your account so you can go back and refer back to it. And that's what I'd done. I was like, right, I am gonna make myself a cloud crop top. And so I started it last night it calls for like it said it calls for a line brand yarn which calls itself an Aran, but is actually about two hundred and forty meters per hundred grams, which is a DK. So I was like, okay, let's narrow that down for what's in my stash. And I found this rusty brown yarn, which I knew when I bought it, it was on a cone, I knew I was gonna double strand it to get something like a DK weight out of it. And that is exactly what I'm doing. It's quite heathered, it's got little flecks of mustard in there. So you know, like, it's a rust and mustard. <laughs> Hello, Faye's favourite colours. Um, so that's what I started swatching with. Now, in the pattern, it calls for a six millimetre hook. And I wasn't a huge fan of how open the fabric was for that. I wanted something that was a little bit closer and denser. So what I've done, and this is a good tip for people that are starting out with garments, I've moved down to a five millimeter hook because I really quite like the fabrics that I was getting out of there. And when I then measured up my gauge, I worked out that what I needed to do was make the, um, the larger size. And it goes from an extra small up to a 5XL. So if I make the largest size, based on my gauge, I am pretty much going to come out with a top that is the size that I want it to be. So that is what I'm working on. And the holding two strands together is working perfectly. It pretty much gives me the, um, the weight of yarn that was in the pattern. And um, I really like the fabric. 
apologies if you're watching, you may be able to hear them. I've just been joined by a little beastie boy. Hello, you. He's got a gammy eye today. I think he's got a bit of a cold and he just wants to be loved. And if you can see him, he's got this little curly whirly, we call it his curly whirly pinky tail. Because when he's really happy, his tail corkscrews. It doesn't just go up with a little crook at the end. He gets a proper little curly whirly corkscrew piggy deal. Right, you know that we're on camera and you need to move. Come on, you. Come here. Come on here. Good boy. Lie down there. Good boy. You live on a nice landed jumper. Yeah, it's slightly wet. Hmm? So the fabric that I'm getting out, I'm happy with. It's got this kind of ribbed effect to it because of the way that the um, stitches are changed for each row. Obviously, I can't go into detail. Love the colour. It will go very nicely with most of my autumnal wardrobe. And I can see I'm literally at the beginning of this. So it's going to take me... I'll, I'll have this done for next month, I would have thought. So what I do know with this um, jumper is that it's got quite a lot of ribbing. It has a double cuff, so you um, rib for a long time and double over, and that's how you do the cuff on it. It's got quite nice big bell sleeves as well. Um, that's a lot of ribbing in crochet, which I'm, I don't really want to do. So I know I'm going to use this jumper as part of my research for using knitted rib instead of crocheted rib. It's also got a nice deep um, collar, so I might do the same for that. And on the bottom, it doesn't actually have any... Um, get off the pattern, Ruby. Thank you. And then the bottom, it doesn't actually have any ribbing at all. But I personally, for me, think that it needs some. Um, I would definitely want some ribbing on the bottom of that to pull it in. Especially as I don't think there's bust shaping in this pattern. So I would use ribbing just to give it a little bit of structure at the bottom. So I don't want a flappy garment that is coming off my boobs and not pulling in at all underneath. So, um, yes, I'm sure this will be done in no time because it's quite chunky. It's not a massive garment. It's in crochet, which is so quick. And um, as I heard on a podcast this morning, thick is quick. And DKR is way quicker than four ply. So, um, yeah, I will be cracking on with that this week and getting it done. So it is the Cloud Crop Top by Colleen at Evolve Crochet. The yarn I'm using is um, the rust colour, or I think it's called Tan Rust. It comes on a cone and it is by Woolly Knit, which is a British brand and it is British wool that I've got with this. I think the cone, it cost me no money at all. I think the cone was £16 for this. So if I, even if I use up every scrap, I will have created a new jumper with some time and £16 worth of British wool. So an absolute bargain, really. Right, we have a cat who's just right in the way, so I'm going to pause for a bit, deal with a troublesome kitten, and then I will come right back. I think this is him being for food, possible chicken, we shall see. Um, so let's move on to feeding the habit. All the autumn colours. <laughs> um... All of the incoming yarn this month is from John Arvin Textiles and it's all for commissions. So I have, and it's all Harvest Shoes as well, but in two different weights. Harvest Shoes is a really lovely blend if you've not come across it before. It's 65% um, Merino and 35% Zwartblaze. And it, of all of the wools and blends that they do, this one has like a very recognisable smell and I think it's a Zwartblaze in it that really, it doesn't smell like some of their other sheepy yarns. It's very specific to Harvest Shoes. So the first skin that I had through is in their four ply and it is like a true standard four ply. It's 400 metres, 437 yards per 100 grams. 
and the colour is called Bramble and it is like a proper, proper blackberry colour. It's that gorgeous um, dark bluey purple and it's lovely. This is going to become a positivity spiral hat for them um, because they sell my patterns and so I need to make up a sample for them in Bramble. So that's what that one is going to become probably next week. And then, and then there are five other colours of Harvest Juice in their Light Aran Worsted range, which comes in at 200 metres per 100 gram skein, which is 219 yards. And this comes in a sort of a fade. So if you can imagine, there are four colours that are the fade, and it is a very autumnal fade. So the lightest of which is called Flax and it is a light mustardy brown. Next one in to paired up against that is called Russet and it's kind of within the same colour range. It's got mustardy tones in it but the Russet is accurate. It also has this rust colour starting to come through. The third one to pair with it is called Bracken and that is a proper rusty orange. So you have this lovely colour palette building up in intensity from the brownie mustard right up into the the rusty colour and then the fourth one to go with that is called pomegranate and it is a very rich um deep orangey red it's lovely and the four together are just such a nice fade very autumnal beautiful fade and all of those are being paired off with a main colour which is called blue spruce which is exactly as it sounds when you look at the underside of a spruce tree and you get that warm bluey green colour that's what blue spruce is and it's beautiful so that will be the main colour and it will work across all of my autumnal colour fades and this is going to be a blanket that was another one of those oh I need to come up with the design and it just went do, 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 and out it came and I was like oh that was nice like a fully formed design idea um, just kind of plopped out of my noodle brain and it was done and then I just chose the colours and Sonia sent them to me and I will be working on this blanket probably in two weeks time but yeah lovely beautiful autumnal fade I'm waiting for the leaves to change colour in our garden and then I'll be going leaf picking to take some nice photographs of all of these yarns together before I work them up. But that is all the incoming for this month. There is yarn coming but I will share that with you next month. For another blanket, I see, well, it's winter, I'm like give me all the blankets, let me design all of the blankets please. <laughs> Um, so that is it for um, for yarns this month. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to work out a stash. I have a lot up there. When I went up yesterday to get the to choose yarn for my cloud crop um, top, I've got one cupboard space which is purely jumper quantities, and I was like, <laughs> I have rather a lot to be able to choose from. I think it's time to make some jumpers and get de-stashing a little bit. So, pleased to be able to do that. On to some quick news beats. The Global Hookups are going to be on Saturday the 20th at 8pm and Sunday the 21st at 9am. And we are now into GMT in the UK. Trina, look at me go. I am on fire. I have got my timings right. Nobody needs to tell me that I've got the wrong thing, that I'm giving you BST when it should be GMT. Um, yay! <laughs> so, GMT, Saturday the 20th of October at 8pm and Sunday the 21st of not October. Oh my God, I've just got the month wrong. November, we're in November for you. I told you, can't be trusted with dates and times and like new medical things. Um... Saturday the 20th of November, GMT at 8pm. Sunday the 21st of November, GMT at 9am. Done. 
like that's when global hookups are come and join us and um, we had some more new folk coming in the other month which was lovely um yeah all the details are in the show notes just come and find them from there with the password it'll be lovely to have you in that session the next thing for quick news beats is that all of your panels for stitches for survival went up to glasgow they are there ready to be displayed I wanted to go up for it, but frankly, they, um, there was a massive threat of train strikes. The um, train workers were threatening strike right the way through COP26. And it's a very long way to go to potentially get stuck or to not get up there. So I'm now not going. I know lots of other people are going. I know that there are a couple of photographers going. And I will hopefully be able to get photos of the whole thing Um back from you to be able to show you how it went but there's been quite a lot of press coverage um, particularly up in Scotland about Stitches for Survival about what we've all been up to um, and what it is that we're trying to represent through this mass craftism and actually it was mentioned in the Glasgow Herald's like top 10 things to do during COP26 one of them was to go to Glasgow Green on Saturday the 6th of November and um, go and look at all of the crocheted, knitted, stitched banners and like the messages of environmental hope that we've all put into um, the Stitches for Survival project. So I, I think there will be quite a lot of coverage over it because it's very visual, which is what they look for when it's media. So I'm hoping that... Um, when you see bits and pieces on the TV about COP26, that you will, um, you might be able to see some of the stuff from Saturday. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see it all pulled together because it's been a huge amount of work for the organisers to pull it all together and make it work logistically, and they've done a great job. So I'm very happy with that. That just leaves me with a uh, Jador. And I have a new podcast recommendation for you today. And it's a little bit different, but it's still craft related. I came across, um, it was in the Spinners, Weavers, Dyers Guild magazine actually, an advert for a podcast. And I was like, well, that's an interesting approach because most podcasters don't tend to advertise with their crafty podcasts. So I gave it a listen and it's called Haptic and Hue. And it's by a lady called Jo Andrews. And she's interesting for... Like, not just because she is a hand weaver, but she's also a broadcaster. So her podcasts are a lot of interviews with people throughout the industry. And the industry might be the fashion industry, weaving, um, textile design, you name it. She covers a lot. She speaks to lots of people that are just interesting that are in the crafting industry. But because of her broadcasting background... The sound quality is amazing. The interview technique is really good. It's a very listenable podcast and it's genuinely interesting to listen to. Um, There are, I think, three series at the moment and it's audio. So if you're looking for something that's a bit more in-depth and knowledge-based, give Haptic and Hue a listen. I don't think you'll be disappointed. If you're like me and you love to kind of sponge up knowledge and information and techniques and just like get into a bit more detail with things then I really think you will enjoy Joel's podcast I certainly have been and even to the point that Matthew came downstairs when I was listening to one and he was like is Gillian Anderson doing a podcast on crafting and I was like no what are you talking about and he was like well that's Gillian Anderson isn't it as in X-Files you know major film star Gillian Anderson and I was like no no that's it's a lady called Jo Jo Andrews and I was like okay sounds really good like it sounds professional and really interesting I was like yes it is so like even to his untrained crafting ear he could hear that there was a difference in that podcast approach to podcasts like mine which are very personal and very like um specific and and personal um kind of related so yeah I, just, I thought it was interesting that he could pick out that it was a different sort of thing that I was listening to really interesting 
Could I say interesting more times? It's a really, really interesting, interesting, interesting podcast to listen to. I've added notes into the show notes, but basically it's on Spotify, it's on the normal places that you can get audio podcasts from. Definite recommendation from me. Uh, Right, that is it from me. I am going to go and get some lunch. Might put the fire on, because whilst it's sunny, it's a little bit chilly, and then I can edit a podcast sat at my desk with the fire. We've got, um, this is a big open space and we've got a dual fire. So it's long and it services that side, which is um, around from the kitchen, which is the um, lounge area and my office, which will eventually be like a little library snug. So I can light the fire on either side of the dual side of the log burner. And obviously heat goes to either side. But if I'm working in my office, I can light the fire on the side of my office and the cat still gets the benefit so he's round in the lounge on his little like boy throne under a blanket beside the fire. Um, but it just means that I can be really directional so I don't feel like I'm wasting um, fuel and resources but I just I had it on yesterday and it was well toasty. I was loving it through there. So was the cat. So I might just be tempted to put a little fire on today and... Uh, heat up a little bit, snuggle down with a cup of tea, edit a podcast and keep the fire burning. It sounds nice, doesn't it? Right, my lovelies, lovely to spend time with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you as ever for all of you that listen and watch. Extra special hugs to lovely patrons who help me do this and the in-depth blog posts and everything else that I do. Um you know that I love it and you know that I like have genuine love for our crochet clan and our bunch of crofters. So until next time, which is the 3rd of December, uh, keep on crafting and I shall see you on Instagram. Bye-bye. Waving with chilly little fingers I'm waving. <laughs> Bye-bye. Sorry, cat, you have to move. Um, what? Do not touch that camera. Do not touch that camera. Wiggy. Come over here. Come here. No. Come here. Pom pom. Come here. Come on. Come on, good boy. Come sit here.